Bon Air Road. Uh, I, I remember very clearly the very first Sabbath I, I was here because I had gotten direction and uh, we were here and, and it was going to be my very first time. I had not actually been out to the place, uh, but I had directions and I knew to come down Ten Hook, which of course is the, actually the long way around, but I wound down Ten Hook and I finally got down here somewhere uh, in, in the vicinity and so I stopped at uh, some little gas station or something and I went in I was going to ask directions. I knew I had to be close, and so I went in and I asked, uh, uh, I said, I'm, uh, I'm looking for, uh, uh, Bone and Road. And I looked. You know where that is? You know, there were two or three in there and looked around and, 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 uh, all of a sudden, one of them, it says, oh, Bone and, ah, yeah, it's right over here, just a block down. So, anyway, live and learn. A lot of water under the bridge in those last 15, uh, 14 years. A lot of things have transpired. But it's really great to be back here with you and to see uh, uh, so many of you. It's, it's really, uh, really wonderful. Uh, my wife and I have been uh, uh, staying busy and on the go. Uh, Mr. McNair, I, I know he wanted to allow me a little extra time so he didn't give all of the uh, uh, the news out of the, uh, the headquarters update. Uh, and he was planning on sharing some of the international reports with you later. But I, I want to share one. We, I want to share just one little segment uh, with you because I read that and I realized, you know, I really have it pretty easy in terms of the places I visit. Uh, there's a note in here, Mr. Kinnear Penman, who is our minister in New Zealand, and he also served in some of the South Pacific uh, islands, uh, uh, you know, New Guinea, Borneo, Vanuatu, uh, some of these places most of us would have difficulty locating on maps, but we've got a brethren in those areas. And Mr. Penman was recently there uh, visiting some uh, uh, new prospective members and some people who, who were interested. And a uh, problem developed in one of the villages where, where he was visiting some of these uh, folks. Uh, the chief of the village uh, took umbrage at me being in the village and ordered me to leave. Well, I took the whispered advice that I was offered, and I didn't respond to the chief. Well, the scene got nasty, and I thought it not wise to stand upon my constitutional rights, which gave me the right to be there. The chief refused to allow the only truck, uh, the only truck owner, uh, for miles around to take me and Jerry elsewhere. Uh, so we walked for a couple of hours that night until we came to someone that uh, let us sleep in their hut. Uh, then the next morning, another three hours walking brought us uh, to a truck that we were able to charter. Uh, this village where they were, now one of the reasons why he didn't want to argue with the chief a whole lot, uh, the village of uh, uh, Benenaveh is uh, a village of the big Nambus tribe there in Vanuatu. In 1969, uh, they held the last publicly known cannibal feast. Uh, 1969 is not that long ago. I guess, you know, he didn't want to antagonize the chief that much. I mean, a lot of years had passed. Uh, who knows, you know. Uh, so, uh, anyway, we now have a nice little group in uh, Benenaveth uh, uh, and in the next little village of uh, Tenmaru. So uh, uh, they uh, uh, anyway. You, you uh, th it, there was another village uh, up in uh, uh, elsewhere uh, where after the feast, some of our members, uh, the local chief, had gotten very upset uh, because they had kept the feast and some of these things, and had ordered them out of the village, demanded that they leave the village, given them a uh, uh, a um, sort of giving them a deadline. Well, uh, they were, of course, in a dilemma. I mean, they, they, this was where they lived. They'd just be, you know, just where their their uh, you know their homes were and their farming area and everything. They'd just be uh, really uh, in, in a terrible situation. So uh, anyway, the, Mr. Penman had uh, contacted headquarters. Mr. Parkin had uh, written a letter uh, there. And uh, Mr. Ken Mr. Penman writes, uh, wrote here to Mr. Party, and he says, you'll remember after the feast writing a letter uh, to the village council of Orap, who had ordered our members to leave. I'm delighted to let you know that your letter has wrought favor for us. 
Uh, the members have been accorded permission to stay. One lady said that a village elder uh, had said that the council was very impressed uh, that an overseas church headquarters would write thus on behalf of their members. It was the first time they had ever received a letter from overseas. Uh, so uh, anyway, Mr. Penman told Mr. Party, and he says, I'd like for you to write for the chief and uh, uh, Benenevest and see if you can't get him straightened out too. So anyway. The uh, we uh, make a little bit of comment on uh, uh, the new fee site in Texas. Uh, Glen Rose, Texas, is the location. It is uh, sort of between uh, Waco and Fort Worth. Uh, it is. Uh, let me say this for anybody that that has nostalgic memories of Big Sandy. This is your place. I mean, it it, it is a very nice little uh, uh, small uh, small place. Uh, they have a uh, County Expo Center there that we have rented a facility, nice a new facility, just uh, three or four years old. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we'll be having services, and immediately next door, just across the parking lot, is a brand new Best Western uh, that just opened, uh, well, since the first of the year, so it's brand new. Uh, but just a very short distance away, about a mile and a half uh, from the uh, convention center, the Expo Center, uh, is a uh, is a camp. Ground uh, Trace Rios, where three rivers come together, a uh, beautifully wooded area and beautiful right there on the riverbank. Well, the thing about this particular uh, uh, campground, they, they not only have places for tents and RVs, which they've got plenty of, but they have cabin and motel rooms right there in the uh, uh, in, in the campground setting. So uh, it's it's sort of the way to, to recapture the spirit of Big Sandy without having to set up a tent. Uh, you, you know, you can just walk out your motel room door and be right there in a campground or a uh, uh, cabin or uh, whatever. So anyway, I, I think it's I think it's going to be a, a, a real uh, popular site, particularly for the brethren over in Texas. We uh, have tried to set things up so that uh, all of our members as, as much as possible, that virtually everyone uh, this year will be within less than a day's drive of the So we've really sort of strained at our resources being able to do that. Uh, and I think the majority of our brethren will be probably within, you know, half an hour, six, uh, half a day, six, six hours or so. Uh, if you draw six, that sort of radius around most of our fee sites, I think it would probably take in uh, the, the overwhelming majority, probably 85, maybe up close to 90 percent of our brethren. So we're uh, uh, delighted uh, with that and uh, uh, hope that that'll work out. Uh, I don't know, do we have that back door locked? If we do, we've got somebody trying to come in. So. Uh, that 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 that, <laughs> that belongs. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the uh, I can see straight through. You see to it. You can't. The ushers couldn't. The uh, 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 anyway. But uh, that's going to work out well. And by the way, also uh, we're going to in Texas uh, uh, this uh, uh, this summer uh, in June. We're going to have a special. Uh, youth camp, a week-long youth camp for our preteen, and uh, it's going to be geared for the eight, twelve-year-old group, and, and uh, we'll let let them show up on on Sunday afternoon, and we'll run our sessions on through uh, uh, on through Thursday, and and uh, I guess uh, we'll have to clear out the camp by by noon on Friday. So it's, uh, it'll be a week, and I think it'll be a real good uh, opportunity. We're we're going to have it set up, so really geared for that age group. And, and a lot of work is going into that. And there will be details that will be sent out to uh, Mr. McNair. In fact, uh, uh, he uh, may find himself recruited in on on, uh, uh, on that. I don't know if he knows. Oh, by the way, let me announce something uh, else. I, I uh, he, he alluded to the fact of uh, uh, the, the last holy day of, of, of unleavened bread up in Alexandria, and I had promised him we would have a headquarters uh, speaker. You're going to have one. Uh, Mr. Meredith is going to be here. So uh, that's, uh, I don't know if Mr. McNair knew that or not, but that's, uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, that's, that's what the plan. So uh, anyway, Mr. Meredith is going to be here for the uh, last part, last, uh, part of the Days of Unleavened Bread, be up there with you for the uh, Holy Day. So he's uh, looking forward to that. And 
I, I think that'll uh, that'll work out good. Now, what we uh, have to tell Mr. and Mrs. Meredith is to make sure they bring Mr. Meredith's new secretary with them, right? Well, brethren, I would like to focus our attention in on something in the New Testament, uh, particularly this afternoon. As we look at the Bible as it was put together, we find that virtually all of the books of the New Testament were completed by the time that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. and Jerusalem church was scattered. However, there were five books of the New Testament, the last five books of the Bible to be written, that were put together about 25 years, approximately, within, let's say, a 20 to 30 year uh, time span, uh, technically I guess a 20 to 28 year time span, uh, after the all the rest of the books in the New Testament were put together. There were five books that were put together afterwards, this period of almost 25 years, approximately 25 years later, and they were the final books of the New Testament. These were the books that the Apostle John wrote. Now, I would ask you the question, to begin with, why were these particular books, which are different than the others in the New Testament, in the sense that John's Gospel it clearly covers different material than the other three Gospels, uh, the uh, uh, material that is covered in his writings, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also particularly uh, the book of Revelation, these books represent the, the completion, the conclusion of the Bible, the conclusion of the New Testament, written a period of over two decades after everything else was finished. Why did God choose to add books afterwards and to add them in the way that he did? Well, I, I, I think we will find, uh, and, and, you know, in Spokesman's Club, all the men uh, learn very early on in, in giving speeches uh, that they're supposed to have an SPS, a specific purpose statement. Well, I'm going to show you a little later, John clearly had a specific purpose statement in his book. He, he makes it very plain, specifically, why he wrote. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn and, uh, as we understand this and uh, as we're, of course, beginning to approach Passover time, uh, there's some things that will tie in with that as well. Uh, to begin with, let's go back and let's understand a little bit of what was happening uh, in the New Testament period. In the, uh, uh, if you look in the book of Second Thessalonians, now First and Second Thessalonians were two of the very first books that were written in the New Testament. Uh, they were epistles of Paul, were both written around 50 A.D. Uh, approximately when you put the story together with the book of Acts, they're pretty apparent uh, the timing on them. Uh, written uh, approximately. Uh, 50 AD, just a matter of, of uh, about 20 years after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, notice what the Apostle Paul brings out as he writes here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He had already been there, had written the letter, the first letter to the Thessalonians, and uh, he had talked about Christ's return. And in chapter 2 and verse 3, he talked about uh, that that day, the day of Christ's return, would not come except certain things uh, happened first. It was not just going to happen any moment. There was a time sequence. And uh, uh, he talks about this system that was going to emerge. And in verse 7, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, Paul says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets or restrains uh, what's holding back will continue to hold back until uh, this individual, this final wicked one, will emerge up out of the midst. That, of course, uh, really, uh, when you understand, that, that has to do with where we are in prophecy right now. I'm sure you've uh, been following some of the events in the Middle East and Europe. Uh, we, we have entered a significant uh, turn uh, in terms of, of what is going on on the world scene uh, that began this past fall this is beginning with Ariel Sharon going on the Temple Mount um, you know the Jews 
normally going down through the uh, Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. But Ariel Sharon, on the day before the Feast of Trumpets, went up on top of the Temple Mount. Uh, he uh, wanted to prove the point that uh, here is Jerusalem under Jewish sovereignty, and yet uh, he knew that the Arabs would uh, not be happy about uh, Jew coming up on top of Temple Mount. Uh, Sharon did not intend to be turned back. If you remember uh, the account, uh, he went up there, he said, well, you know, you just go up himself and pray. Of course, he took 1,000 policemen with him. That's how he got up there. Uh, he literally, he took 1,000 policemen and, and said, I think I want to go up there to pray. Uh, and uh, so he got up there and he, he spent his time. Uh, and that, of course, is what set in motion all of the events, the rock throwing and, and, and all the things. And of course, if you saw it, you know, you hear about rock throwing, things, somebody just picking up a rock and throwing it. Uh-uh. If you saw any of the news footage, uh, they were throwing rocks all right. They were using slingshots. The same kind of thing that David used on Goliath. Uh, well, the Jews were very familiar with what that sort of thing could do. Uh, this is the time it was the Philistines using it on the Jews instead of the Jews using it on the Philistines. Uh, that's what Palestinian means, by the way. Did you know that? You know, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., uh, they were so infuriated at the Jews, they wanted to wipe out everything connected with the Jews. And so they renamed the Roman province of Judea with the Latin name for Philistine, Palestinian, which was the Latin word uh, that meant the land of the Philistines. And so that's why a Jew will never use the term Palestine, because... Uh, to call it Palestine, you're referring to it as the land of the Philistines. No, it's not the land of the Philistines. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it is, uh, as, uh, you know, Menachem Vega never referred to the occupied West Bank. He referred to Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Uh, that, that was, uh, he wanted to make it plain, you know, what it was. Well, that set in motion the series of events. Uh, there at the fall festival that has now, of course, brought the collapse of the Barak government and the election of Ariel Sharon by the largest majority in Israeli history. You saw the final vote result. He had over 62% of the vote. Now, Mr. Barak was in there. Uh, uh, President Clinton had actually sent his uh, campaign advisors over to help Barak get elected. Uh, the last time. That was his candidate. And uh, he was going to go down in history. Uh, he, he wanted to uh, be remembered for something uh, of note and, uh, you know, get the Nobel Peace Prize and the whole thing. So he was going to bring peace in the Middle East. Well, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wait for Jesus Christ to bring peace in the Middle East. But uh, what has happened over there now has has totally changed the whole dynamic. And I think what we're going to see over the weeks and months ahead are going to be very interesting. What's going on in the uh, in Europe as well. But anyway, I don't want to get too far off on that. Uh, Paul is talking about here in Second Thessalonians two the fact that this mystery of iniquity was already at work twenty years, twenty or or uh, thirty years, thirty years after, less than 30 years after the resurrection or less than 20 years after 31 to 50, so just under 20 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ this system was already at work. Now if you go back uh, to uh, Second, uh, Second Corinthians, which was written maybe 5 or 6 years later in perhaps the mid 50s in Second Corinthians chapter 11 uh, Paul is concerned about the Corinthian church as he says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, having their minds corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. And then he talked about someone preaching another Jesus. He talked about another spirit, another gospel. So here, 25 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not just that the mystery of iniquity was already at work. Paul was concerned that church congregations and church members were being subverted and corrupted from the simplicity of Christ and that there was another Jesus being preached, another spirit. 
another gospel. Oh, they used the right words, but what they were teaching was very different. Now, let's move on about ten years beyond that. And we come to the book of Jude that was written in uh, perhaps the uh, mid-60s, maybe somewhere around 65 uh, A.D. Now, here is Jude, who was a younger brother uh, to uh, James and therefore uh, to Jesus Christ. He was the son of Joseph and Mary. Um, you know, Christ's four brothers are mentioned and named elsewhere in the Gospels. Uh, technically, his half-brothers, because he, Joseph was not, of course, his father. He was the son of God, but after his birth, uh, Joseph and Mary, as a normal married couple, had other children, and, and uh, uh, James was the oldest of those, and then uh, uh, Jude and Simeon, and uh, then the sisters, uh, who are not mentioned by name in the Scripture. Now, Jude writes here in the book of Jude, and he says in verse 3, a little short book, he said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered. There certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lawlessness and denying our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude says now that these individuals had actually crept into the church. And what were they doing? They were turning grace into lawlessness. So their message was distorted. Jesus Christ came certainly talking about grace. But what is grace? Grace has to do with God's freely bestowed, freely offered gift. That's what grace is. You know, we talk about someone being a very gracious host. What does that mean? Well, it means someone that just makes you you feel uh, like she really wants you to, to take or to enjoy what she's offering. You know, the, her food or her drink or, or whatever, the hospitality she's offering. Uh, she's a gracious host. She just makes you, you feel like she really wants to give it to you. She, you're, you're really... Uh, uh, that, that you're you're wanted you're, you're in that way. Now, grace has to do with what God freely offers, freely bestows, freely gives. But Jude says that there were individuals crept in unawares. Now, who was unaware of them? Was God unaware? Oh no, God knew who. But the leaders in the congregation, men like Peter, Paul, James, John, and others. They weren't aware of who these individuals were and what they were up to. And those people just sort of came in, wormed their way in, uh, came into positions of prominence, and then had begun to subvert. Had begun to, to subvert. They were turning grace into lawless. So they took the concept of grace, but what they were promoting was a concept that, that grace somehow meant that the law of God was done away. And, he says, they were denied God. You see, the two heresies, well, they talked about God, but it was another. The two initial heresies that began to creep in had to do with law and grace, and it had to do with who and what is God, the very nature of God. Now, this is the stage. Now, let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter is the la is was the uh, sort of the capstone of the first twenty-two books of the New Testament. There are twenty-seven books in the New Testament, twenty-two of which were put together by Peter in the initial canon of the New Testament. Five others that were added by John uh, about you know a number of years later, twenty-five, thirty years after Peter had had completed that this initial canon, John added in five more books. Now, Peter makes reference to that in Second Peter chapter 1. Peter is at the end of his life. And he uh, talks about, in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. Always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. 
I think it means as long as I'm in this tabernacle, this, this physical body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. I want to remind you of things, knowing that shortly I must put on this, my tabernacle, my temporary body. I know I'm going to die soon. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my deceit, to have these things always in remembrance. Now, what did Peter mean? He was going to, wanted to ensure that they would have these things always in remembrance after he was dead. Was he going to leave them a tape recording of his sermons? No. You know, he wasn't, uh, uh, he didn't tell them, you know, I'm going to have, uh, I'm uh, putting a CD together of all my best sermons and, and you'll be able to download them from the internet. No, the only way that Peter had of ensuring them a permanent remembrance was that he put it in right. He wanted them to have permanently in mind. I will endeavor after my decease that you may have these things always in remembrance. He was putting together the initial canon of the New Testament. Now notice, as we have gone through verses 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, if you'll notice, Peter is continually speaking in the first person singular. I will invent. I will not be negative. Uh, I think it's me. I must put off this my tabernacle. I will endeavor. But now notice in verse 16, he makes an abrupt switch. He talks in these verses what I'm going to do, and now in verse 16, he says we. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him on the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. For until you do well that you take it. Who is the we? Whoever the we is, we are the ones that have the sure word of prophecy. The we is Peter and John. That's very easily provable because he identifies the we. He says, we were with him in the holy mount. We heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Who was with Jesus in the Holy Mount? Who heard the voice from heaven? We'll just turn back to Matthew, if you will. And uh, we'll come back to about chapter 16. Uh, end of 16, chapter, the beginning of chapter 17. End of chapter 16, Christ told the disciples that there were some of those that would see him in his glory. Then in chapter 17, verse 1, six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he brought them up into a high mountain apart. He was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. Uh, Moses and Elijah appeared. A cloud overshadowed them, verse 5. A voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased here you him. Now, as you go through the book of Acts, you find that James, the brother of John, was the very first of the apostles to be martyred. He, was, he died. That's recorded in Acts chapter 12. That was in the very early days of the New Testament church. So now, here is Peter at the end of his life. There were only three men that Jesus took up into the mountain to see him transfigured. They were in the holy mount. They heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. Peter says, Now look, I'm going to ensure that you have something permanent to remind you of the truth, to keep you in remembrance of what you've been taught. I want to ensure that after my decease, you can always be in remembrance of that. And then he said, we, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables. We have the sure word of prophecy. Who are the we? We were with him in the holy mount. Peter and John. James had been dead by this time for, uh, this time for about 20 years or so. 25 years maybe. 
So Peter clearly identifies to anyone who had read the material that he assembled that he and John had the sure word of prophecy. And of course, Peter talked about in Second Peter 2, there were false prophets among the people and there shall be false teachers among you. Privately will bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, bringing upon themselves with destruction. So Peter again talks about the turmoil that is happening, the false doctrines that are being brought in. And he identifies that he and John have been selected by God to have the sure word of prophecy, more sure, more certain than anything from anyone else. They were responsible for assembling and putting together the New Testament as they had. Peter put together the 22 books uh, that were extant at the time just prior to his death. But about 20, 25 years goes by. By this time, virtually the whole first generation of Christians is dead. Certainly all of the immediate disciples of Jesus, all of the other twelve, are long since dead, and most of them for 20 years or more. Very few survived past 70 AD. Most of that, uh, uh, now, now we're, you know, years along. The Apostle John was very elderly. He was, uh, well, 90 AD, he would have been approximately 90 years old. Even if you figure he was a little bit younger than Jesus, uh, he would still be uh, be close to, certainly at the very youngest, he would have been in his late 80s, and maybe on up around 90 or 91. And through his 90s, because uh, we uh, we have historical record that John died uh, just right around the time of the of the end of that first century. He lived uh, up to almost to right half a hundred years of age, very late 90s. So Peter has given testimony that they are to look to Peter and they're to look to John. Now here are three other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, everyone already has that. Uh, this has been around for all these years. Now John comes along and he is writing another, yet another gospel. And I think when you go through it, it can pretty well be, be shown just from the uh, text from, and the things that are said, that the gospel of John was the first of the books that he wrote, followed by his three letters, and then the book of Revelation, I think, clearly was the very last book that he wrote. When you read the book of Revelation, you certainly get the sense of finality. It's over with, it's completed. You read the end of the book of Revelation, you don't expect somebody to sit down and write another book. That's fine. So, it, it, uh, but notice here in in the Gospel of John. First, let me show you uh, what. Uh, uh, let, let me let me show you. Mentioned John wrote an SPS. So let me uh, let me show you here in uh, John chapter twenty. John chapter 20 and verse 29, Jesus said to Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they which have not seen and yet have believed. Now notice verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. You know, it's interesting. John uses certain words in, in uh, far more than, than uh, any of the others. The, the, book, the, the word believe or believing is used 99 times in the Gospel of John. That's several times more than all the other Gospels added together. John talks about believing. He talks about abiding or continuing. Again, multiple times more than all the others. Uh, he, he uses that particular word. Uh, it's actually translated two or three, word, two or three ways in, in most English translations. I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, but he uses that like 41 times. John talks about the truth. He uses the term the truth in the Gospel of John and in 1 
the, the, the first, second, and third John uses it more than everybody else in the New Testament added together. Over and over he talks about the truth. He talks about something being being made manifest, being clearly shown, and uh, particularly in relationship to Jesus Christ. The Apostle John focuses in on, on certain things. In fact, he says, he emphasizes here, he said, look, these things are written. John says, why did John write his gospel? These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. There are a lot of heresies, a lot of ideas going around about who and what was Jesus. Was he just a good man? Was he a prophet? Was he a rabbi? Uh, there were Gnostics who were coming up with all sorts of, of uh, ideas that were really based on, on uh, Greek philosophy, trying to sort of read some of those things into the Bible. John says, I've written what I've written uh, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John wanted his readers to understand what led to life. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to the end of the book of First, of first John, the, the first letter or epistle of John, and you might read that back here in First John chapter 5. And in verse 13, again, sort of an SPS, specific purpose statement. Here's why he wrote the book. First John 5.13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is the confidence that we have in him that we ask if we ask anything according to his will he hears. If we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the patient, uh, the petitions that we have desired of him. He said, I've written, I've written to you that believe on his name. I want you to know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, let's go back here to the Gospel of John. Let me show you a few things. As we open up in the Gospel of John, John introduces Jesus Christ and who he really is in a way that none of the other Gospels, nowhere else fully expounds that. John opens in John 1, verse 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So here is God the Father, and here is one who was with God the Father, the one that we know as the Word. The Word was with God, and he was also God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was light. The light was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. And the darkness comprehends it not. Then he goes on that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Reference to John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He wasn't the light, John the Baptist wasn't, but he was to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Now notice verse 10, he, referring to Christ, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Jesus came to the Jews. Now John is writing, after the destruction of Jerusalem, after certainly the Jewish community has uh, officially uh, rejected uh, Jesus Christ and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish religious leadership, John emphasizes Jesus is the Word because he goes on, verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And John bore witness of it. Now, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and with God. Not anything was made that was made without Him. And yet He came into the world. He came into the world that He had made. And the world didn't know it. He was not recognized or acknowledged. Though He was, in reality, the very instrument of creation. Yet the world did not acknowledge Him. The world did not recognize Him. Here he was, 
the source of life. It was unrecognized. And yet, John goes through to say, here is the basis of being able to recognize him. You see, he comes on and he talks about uh, John the Baptist, who was a voice crying in the wilderness, as he says, verse 23. Uh, John the Baptist bore witness. Uh, verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. John bore record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. I didn't know him, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he that baptized with the Holy Spirit. I saw and bore record that this is the Son of God. Next day, John was standing there with two of his disciples, looking upon Jesus as he walked. He said to the disciples, Behold the Lamb of God. So here was the Word who was in the beginning, who was the instrument of creation, who came into the world that he had made and was unaccepted, unrecognized, unacknowledged. God sent a messenger. And that messenger pointed him out. And he said, this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one that takes away the sins of the world. And from this day, from this point, Jesus began to gather certain disciples. The first disciple that he had chronologically was Andrew, who was one of these two men standing here with John the Baptist. Andrew then went and got his brother Peter and came and introduced him. And it begins to tell the story here in John chapter 1. Now, it's interesting because... John uses a particular word. There are basically three terms used in the, in the New Testament, uh, in the Greek language that, that have similar type meanings. One is a word that means, uh, uh, well, the Greek word is, is dunamis. It's the word we get our word dynamic from, or dynamo. It means mighty work. It's sometimes translated mighty work or miracle. And there, that is a term that's used number of places in the New Testament. It refers to, to the great mighty works done by Jesus and others. Uh, there's another word that, that basically means a, a wonder, a marvel, some miraculous, marvelous occurrence. Uh, it, miracle would probably be the best translation of that word. There is another word that is used primarily in the book of John. And it's a word that most literally means sign. Now, sometimes that word is translated sign, sometimes it's translated miracle, uh, though it, it is, it's a little different. It certainly refers, in, in, usually in context, uh, or frequently in context, it refers to miraculous signs, but it is, it's a word that literally means sign. John, in the Gospel of John, uses that word, and he shows through seven specific signs that he recalls. Uh, John records a number of things. He uh, focuses in, a, one way of going through the book of John uh, is to note John primarily on what Jesus said and did on seven different festival occasions. The other thing is he, he reveals, uh, let's notice here in John chapter 2, calling your attention to something, uh, Jesus is at the wedding supper in Cana, and they ran out of wine. And his mother came to him and said, they have no wine. Jesus said, well, what does that have to do with me? And she said, she told the servant, she said, well, look, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And so Jesus told them to fill the water pots with water, and they filled them. And he told them, now start drawing it out, taking it, you know, go serve a glass to the governor of the feast. They just sort of looked at one another and thought, you know what? Uh, Hope we don't get in trouble. Uh, I don't think he wants water. But uh, they drew it out and took it to him. And verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he didn't know where it came from. The servants knew. They, they had drawn the water, you know. They, they knew what it was. And the governor called the bridegroom and he said, uh, you know, normally at the beginning of the feast, 
men put their best wine out, and then afterward, after people have eaten and drank, uh, they serve some not quite as good. You've obviously kept the best for last. Now notice verse 11. This beginning of miracles, and the word literally is sign. This beginning of sign did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. This was right before the Passover mentioned in verse 13. The first public Passover of Jesus' ministry. So the very first thing, you see, one of the things that John shows throughout the Gospel of John is that he makes a contrast between the fact of Israel's need and the fact that the Messiah is the source of supply all those needs. That's a vital lesson for us to learn. Whatever your need. Now, we're going to notice this. We'll notice that as John goes through these signs, he starts out by number. Now, he doesn't list all the things that Christ did. You can go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke and find a number of miracles mentioned that Jesus did that John doesn't mention. In fact, there's only just one or two of the miracles that Jesus did that the other Gospels mentioned that John also did. John picked out certain specific miracles. This was the beginning of his introducing his power to his disciples. John the Baptist had pointed him out. It actually pointed him out to most of his disciples. He said, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now here, Jesus, after his baptism, the 40 days in the wilderness, the fasting, the overcoming of Satan, he's at this wedding supper. Uh, he changes water into wine. And they come on down to the Passover and this is the first Passover of Jesus' human ministry, and this is the Passover where he cleanses the temple. And it makes quite a production. You know, he walks in. First thing you know, uh, he is, uh, there's pandemonium going on in the uh, outer courtyard because he has opened the gate uh, where the uh, these animals were all pinned up and turned over the money changers. Anybody's ever been to an auction barn can sort of picture the things taking place uh, when he opens the gate and cracks the whip and all of a sudden you got all these oxen and all these sheep and all these goats um, who are you know going through the chute and I suspect everybody's beginning to dodge and get out of the way in a hurry and uh, this created quite a stir needless to say and uh, we're told in Verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem in the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. Again, the same word, not actually the word miracle, but signs, certainly miraculous signs. Now, you come right on down into chapter 3, Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, who was one of the leaders, he came to him privately by night and said, Master, we know that you're a man sent from God, for no one can do what you do, the signs that you do, no one can do that except God's will. Jesus now talks to Nicodemus. And uh, he makes a contrast in, ver in verse 20 and 21. And John emphasizes this contrast between those who do evil and those who do truth. So you learn something. We we're introduced to this word truth that we're going to find throughout uh, the Gospel of John and through his writings in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, there's a contrast. You see, the truth is not just something you believe, it's something you do. And doing the truth is contrasted with doing evil. Now, as we come on down uh, a little later, you, you read about the story of the woman at the well in Samaria and Christ's encounter. And uh, he comes on from Samaria on up back to Galilee after the Passover, and he's up there for the uh, for Pentecost. And um, John chapter four and verse forty-six, Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. This is where he had made the water into wine. 
And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, which was fairly nearby. And when he heard Jesus was come out of Judea and into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Jesus said, well, except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. And the nobleman said, sir, please come. My son is near death. And Jesus said, go your way. Your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken, and he went his way. And the servants met him and said, your son lives. You know, he, he, he's taking a turn. He's getting better. And, they, and the man asked him, so well, when did that happen? When did he make that turn and said, well, his fever broke yesterday at a particular time. Man knew that was the time Jesus had spoken those words. And verse 54, now notice, this is again the second sign that Jesus did when he would come out of the end of the Galilee. Now, it's not the second miracle that he'd ever performed because we just got through reading. He'd performed miracles and signs there at the, in, in the temple complex there at the Passover. But John didn't record any of those specifically, just refers to the fact that he had done so. You see, John starts us numbering. Starting with the water, water turned to wine, he says this was the beginning of the sun. Then in four, uh, John 4, verse 54, he says, now this is the second of the signs. Okay, with that in mind, we sort of get the idea John is numbering signs. And as we come on through, we'll notice what some of the rest of them are, and then we'll begin to put them together and see. Um, because as I say, most of these are not mentioned in other gospel accounts, and most of the miracles mentioned in the other gospel accounts aren't mentioned here. A little bit of overlap, not a whole lot. Well, as you come on down to chapter 5, we've come to a festival of the Jews. Uh, the context, I think, shows that it was a fall festival. And Jesus is there in Jerusalem. And uh, there was a certain man, verse 5, which had an infirmity for 38 years. He, had, he was uh, uh, crippled. And Jesus saw him lying there. And he knew that he had been now for a long time in that case. And he said, uh, you want to be made whole? And the impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. There, there had been from time to time an angel that would come and, and uh, there had been some healings that had taken place here at this pool of Siloam. And he said, You know, I'm, I'm crippled and I can't get down there. Nobody uh, puts me down there. And Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Immediately, the man was made whole, took his bed and walked the same day was his back. And as you go on through, this created quite a stir because Jesus had healed him and uh, this had become such a stir that uh, uh, later on, even uh, considerably later, uh, it was uh, uh, it was spoken of, uh, even on back in John chapter 7, at the next fall festival season, uh, Christ referred back uh, in John 7 verse 23 to the fact they were still angry with him because he had made a man whole on the Sabbath. Uh, that had been that, that earlier occasion. That's the one John mentioned. Here was a great fun that created quite a bit of uh, impact. It is the third one that is mentioned of this man who had no strength in his limb, no strength in his leg, and he was given that strength. Jesus then talked about the uh, uh, judging righteous judgment, and he said in verse 36 of John 5, I have a greater witness than that of John, that of John the Baptist. The works that the Father has given me to finish, the same works I do. Those bear witness of me. And the Father himself which has sent me has borne witness of me. You don't have his word abiding in. Well, he said, you don't have the love of God in. Verse 42. But I'm come in my Father's name. Now, um, as he comes on down through chapter uh, 6, 
he, here at a Passover, uh, just prior to the Passover, we find the, that he had a crowd. This is, the, this is the miracle that is mentioned in all four of the Gospel accounts, by the way. Uh, the only one that is mentioned in every account. And that is the feeding of the 5,000. Right prior to the Passover. Jesus took the loaves and the fishes uh, in verse 11. And uh, verse 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments. And they gathered 12 baskets. And verse 14, then those men which had seen the miracles or the sign that Jesus did said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And as you come on down through the rest of John chapter 6, uh, John, uh, Jesus has crossed over back to Capernaum and uh, uh, he is teaching them about the true bread, the bread of God. Uh, he says, I'm the bread of life and contrast it with the, uh, the manna that had come in the wilderness, Jesus was the bread of life. And when we come up to the Passover season, uh, we're reminded of that. As you come on down a little further in John chapter 7, we pick up the story at the next fall festival. This is the fall festival season prior to the crucifixion, the fall festival season in 30 A.D. And beginning in verse 37 of John 7, it is the last great day. We come on through those events in chapters uh, 8 and 9. And um, in John chapter 9, we come to the fifth sign. And that is uh, this man who was blind that Jesus healed in John chapter 9. And uh, some of the Pharisees were upset. They said, this man is not of God uh, because, you know, he healed someone on the Sabbath. And others said, well, how can a man that is a sinner do such signs? That's the, the word. There was a division among them. And uh, then they tried to dispute whether the man had actually been blind. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. And then he taught them a lesson, uh, beginning in verses 39, 40, and 41, uh, about spiritual blindness and judgment. Well, as you come on down into chapter 11, In chapter 11, you read about Lazarus, who was the brother of Mary and Martha and a good friend of Jesus, and Lazarus became very ill. And the sisters sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Jesus delayed for several days and then got ready to go. And uh, uh, when they got there, or before they did, you know, Jesus told the disciples, well, come on, we're going. Uh, he said, our friend Lazarus, please. We're going to wake him up. Well, they didn't understand what he meant. They said, well, if he's asleep, you know, that's probably good. Maybe he's getting better. And Jesus told them plainly, verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And he said, verse 15, I'm glad for your sake that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go to him. So they came down there, and of course, what did Jesus do? He raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 43, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Many of the Jews, verse 45, which came to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did, believed on them. And when they came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, he called a council, verse 47, they said, what are we going to do? This man does many times. We let him alone, everybody. This was, of course, number six that he's been counting. It is the last of the great miracles that we have record of uh, in the Gospel of John until you come to the greatest miracle of all, which is what is described right at the very end of uh, the Gospel in John chapter 20. Jesus, of course, had been crucified. He had been buried early on the morning of the first day of the week, the very first opportunity to embalm the body. Mary Magdalene and some of the others had come, and when they got there to the sepulchre, uh, John chapter 20, verse 1, they found the stone rolled away, and the grave was empty. And they ran back and told Peter and John. And John records the fact, uh, you know, interesting, you remember certain details. John may be 90 years old, but he remembers very clearly he outran Peter. Uh, when they went from, Jeru when they ran out of Jerusalem out to the tomb, uh, they came forth, 
Uh, verse 4, they both ran together and the other disciple did outrun Peter. Came first to the sepulcher. Yeah, I was faster than he was. And he stooped down and looked in. Now he was faster, but he wasn't bolder. Because he got there and he, you know, got there first and he looked in. The place was empty. And, uh, he saw and then the, uh, when Peter got there, uh, verse 60, or verse 6, uh, Peter went in. And after Peter went in, well then the other disciple, verse 8, went in. And he saw, verse 8, and believed. So John was the first one that really believed. Peter saw it, but he didn't fully comprehend. None of the others really comprehended what had happened. Mary, of course, is still waiting out there and crying and just distraught. She can't figure out what happened. She thought they took the body away. When Jesus appeared to her, uh, and then uh, later appeared to the twelve, but when he appeared to the twelve, Thomas uh, was not present with the others. And so the others later told Thomas about what they had seen. And that, that the Lord was alive. He appeared to him. Thomas said, I don't believe Unless I can put my hand in the front of his nail. Unless I can put my hand in his thigh. I'm not going to believe it. Fellas, he said, I saw him. We all saw it. His blood poured out on the ground. We took his cold, dead body down and buried it. He's dead. I don't know what you guys saw. But I know he's dead, and I'm not going to believe it. Well, sure enough, a week later... Thomas was there, and they were all together, and, and uh, Jesus just suddenly appeared right in the middle of it. And he looked over at Thomas, and he said, Thomas, come here. I want you to stick your finger in the hole. In fact, while you're at it, go ahead and stick your hand in my side. Just reach up in there. Come on. Thomas didn't want you. Come on. Don't be faithless. I want you to believe. You want to stick your hand in there? Go ahead. Thomas answered, My Lord, my God. Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. Now, blessed are they that haven't seen and believe. And many other signs. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. You see, the greatest sign of all was the sign of the resurrection, of the living, resurrected Christ. It's the seventh one that John made. But these are written. There are a lot of signs that he did, but I just recorded seven of them. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that believing on him. You might have life through his name. Now, interesting. You know, Israel's need can only be met by the Messiah going all the way back to the first time. You know, in the midst of in the midst of the needs of of the uh, wedding stuff, peace that was taking place. You know, the Messiah. The first thing that he, the first miracle had to do was, was providing, uh, for a joyous occasion. The first sign that he did had to do with, with the joy, celebration. He's the source of that. Without him, there can be no joy and no celebration. The second sign that he, that he, that John records, the second one, John enumerates it in number two was here with someone sick. And they were given help. He's our source of help. He also, in the healing of the impotent man, the man who had no strength, no power in his limbs. The Messiah was the source of strength. He gave him strength and his legs were strengthened and he stood up and he walked. feeding of the 5,000. They were hungry and he said the healing of the blind man. He restored sight. 
He gave vision to the blind. And then finally, he said, Lazarus, some boy. The most impressive miracle of his ministry. Dead came to life. But the greatest of all was the fact that after being crucified, after pouring out his blood, three days and three nights later, he came forth out of the tomb, not simply restored to physical life as Lazarus was, but he set forth in glory and in power. We have illustrated Israel's needs and the Messiah's capacity to meet those needs, and he's the only one that can provide them. He's the source of joy, health, strength, nourishment, sight, and life. Now it's interesting because did you know that God the Father provided three specific witnesses, at least as John enumerates it, I mean all the miracles certainly involve the power of God the Father, but back in John chapter 5, in John chapter 5 and verse 8, we're told that there are three that bear witness. Three witnesses. You know, the Old Testament says in the mouth of two or three thing is declared. There are three that bear witness. You see, he, the, the subject uh, he's talking about uh, is uh, that... Uh, uh, here of Jesus Christ, and says, the three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. This is the witness of God which he testified of his Son. Now, in a very specific way, you see, you have to have read the Gospel of John to know what he's talking about in First John. Because when the Gospel of John opens, what is the first witness that God gave that this is the Messiah? John the Baptist, even though John the Baptist was actually a first cousin, or was not a first cousin, but a cousin, his, his Mary, uh, his mother, Elizabeth, was a first cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now that's recorded in the other Gospels. So even though there was a family connection, John the Baptist had grown up in a remote area and had had no contact with Jesus during those years. So John the Baptist would not recognize him when he saw him walking up. But God had revealed to John. John knew that his mission was to bear witness of the Messiah, but John didn't know him. It wasn't like uh, they sort of planned it out and said, okay, you go out there and you tell everybody I'm the Messiah. So God had told John to carry out this mission. John was, 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 that was the very purpose of his birth. And God had revealed to John, he said, you know, in effect, John said, well, Lord, I'm very glad to point out the Messiah, but I don't know who he is. You remember? God, John says, he says, the one that sent me to baptize, this is recorded in John chapter 1, the one that sent me to baptize said to me, now, you're out here, you're baptizing. The one that you see the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove and remaining on him, that the Messiah. You see, that's what John says. The uh, uh, in John one thirty two, John bore a record. He said, "I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining. That's the one that baptizes with the Holy Spirit." So I saw it, verse 34, and I bore record that this is the Son of God. So here's God's witness. The first witness, you see what were we told? There are three that bear witness. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. The Spirit bore witness. And John the Baptist saw this miraculous display. I saw it, and I bore record this is the Son of God. So God the Father identified Jesus Christ in a special way to John the Baptist. There was something else. Uh, you know, there was a specific miracle involving water that had a dramatic effect on the disciples. It occurred right after the feeding of the 5,000. After the feeding of the 5,000, if you remember the story, 
the, uh, this is back in, in John chapter 6. Jesus departed to a mountain to pray, but the disciples, he told them, he said, you get in the boat and you cross on over the sea. They got in the boat, went over the sea towards Capernaum, John 6, 17, and it was dark and Jesus wasn't drunk. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind and they rode and they rode and they looked up and they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the ship and they were afraid. You bet they were. And he said, don't be afraid, it's me. And they willingly received him into the ship. Now, let's just go back to Matthew's account because Matthew gives a more detailed account of the same thing. In Matthew chapter uh, uh, 14, that uh, uh, records the 5,000, and then the uh, ship, Matthew 14, 24, we'll pick it up. The ship was in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. The wind was contrary. It was the fourth watch. And Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, and they said, it's a spirit. And they scared to death. There's this apparition, something's walking on the water. Jesus spoke up and he said, don't be afraid, be of good cheer. It's I, don't be afraid. Peter said, if it's really you, then let me come out there with you. Bid me to come unto you on the water. Verse 28, he said, well, come on. Peter came down out of the ship and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And then he looked up and he saw the wind and he got scared and began to think. That's what happens to us sometimes. We start out straight guns, as long as we have our eyes on fight, we're making progress, and all of a sudden we look around and say, wait a minute, I can't do this. Peter began to think. You know, sometimes we look at that and we say, well, old Peter didn't have much faith. Well, I'll tell you what, he took more steps than any of us ever took, right? Immediately, Jesus reached forth his hand and he caught him and he said unto him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Now notice verse 33. What's the impact it had on the disciples? When they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, you're the Son of God. The truth, you're the Son of God. It's the first reference that we have where they really understood and said, You are the Son of God. You walk on the water while I created the water. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with Him. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. He, but He came into the world, the world created by Him, and the world knew Him not. The element recognized Him. You know... He commanded the wind to be still, and he walked on the water. He created the wind and the water. God the Father bore witness of him. Direct testimony to the disciples. The Spirit descended as a dove. God the Father bore record before John the Baptist, who in turn to others. Then he bore record before the disciples as Jesus came. They were the only ones who saw this. Jesus didn't tell it to the others. There were people curious. John records that in, in, in his gospel. There were folks who were curious, saying, how did you get over here? You know, you, they left the boat. You were still here and we couldn't find you. Now you're over here in the next city. How'd you get here? Jesus didn't answer. And then, of course, the final thing, you see, also, the blood was also a witness. You know, John records the fact of a spear being thrust in, into his side and the blood pouring out that is there. You see, they all saw the blood poured out. He was the Lamb of God. When he appeared there to Thomas and the others, and he said, stick your hand in. You see, even resurrected and in glory, the symbol of his sacrifice was still there. The hole was still there. The hole in his side. There was no blood. There was no blood. It had all been poured out on the ground. And poured out for you and for me. God the Father bore record. Bore record in a miraculous way. 
There were signs and wonders. These signs are recorded, John says, that you may know. Now notice back in the book of 1 John, written after the Gospel of John, and in 1 John, John sort of builds on what he's talked about in the Gospel of John. John 1 verse 1, 1 John 1 verse 1, that which was from the beginning. You remember John 1, 1 started out in the beginning was the word? John, 1 John only makes sense if you've already read the Gospel of John. So he builds from that. And he says, now that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, our hands have handled, of the word of life. John is the only one that refers to Jesus as the word. Life was manifested and we've seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John clearly emphasizes the one that we, the one that is our Lord, the one that is our Savior. The one that is the Messiah is not just a good man. He's not just a prophet. He is the Son of God. And He was made flesh and He dwelt among us. And He poured out His blood for us and He paid the penalties. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there were signs that were evident. And John writes now at the end of his life, a very elderly man, and he says, I was there and I know. What I'm telling you, I saw. All of these heresies and all of these ideas and speculations that have crept in. And John says, I know. I was there. I am an eyewitness. I testify of what I saw. God bore record. God the Father declared him to be his son. There were signs that I saw, and I bear record of those things. And he talks about it as you go on through. And hence this thing. John discusses a number of things. Talks about the importance of loving one another, of loving God, of obeying God, of keeping His commandments. He tells us in 1 John 4, verse 10, herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Tells us in verse 19, we love Him because He first loved us. Verse 3 says, uh, John chapter, 1 John 5, verse 3. He says, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not grievous. There were those who were seeking to turn grace into lawlessness. And John says, look, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. His commandments aren't grievous. He says in verse 9, you know, if you receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater than God. This is the witness which of God which He testified of His Son. So, He says in verse 13, or, or in verse um, 11, He says, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. It's just that simple. These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now it's interesting in Second John, he talks about here, a very short little book, but he says, the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth. Not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake which dwells in us. And then he goes on down in verse 3, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. Verse 4, I greatly rejoice that I found of your children walking in the truth if we've received the commandment from the Father. Verse 6, this is love that we walk after His commandments. Many deceivers are entered into the world. God emphasizes walking in the truth. And if you transgress, verse 9, and don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. You've got to continue in Christ's teaching to abide in Him. 
if you abide in the doctrine of Christ, you have the Father and the Son. Somebody comes and brings you another doctrine, don't you see? In 3 John, he goes on, and again, stressing, uh, here in verse 3, he talks about, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Even as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Talks in verse 8 about being fellow helpers of such, that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. But then he talks about this Diotrephes who was already sort of taken over in a local area and was beginning to put the true Christians out. John bore record of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He bore record of the truth. He said, I'm writing you these things that you may know, that you may have confidence in what you believe. Because your confidence doesn't just rest on somebody's speculation or somebody's idea, you have the direct, infallible testimony of God Himself, who's born with you. Yes, this is the one, without Him was not anything made that was made. He came into the world, the world did not recognize Him or acknowledge Him. But He was made manifest, He was revealed over, over, Reveals to the religious leaders, reveals to his disciples, reveals to the world. John says, I'm setting the record. I want you to have confidence in what you believe. Brethren, the Apostle John was putting together the final part of what we call the New Testament. Providing a final record of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John testified of who it was. And he said, we know. I was him. Peter had borne record earlier. He says, we have the sure word of prophecy. We know, John and I, we've been given that record. Brethren, you and I have it reported for us. And on the basis of that record, you and I can have confidence. Can have absolute confidence and therefore belief. But the kind of belief, the kind of belief that God is asking, is not just an academic belief, well, I believe this or I believe that. Real belief is belief from the heart. The kind of belief that changes life. You know, Paul expressed it in Romans 10, verse 10, when he says, if you believe from the heart. Believe from the heart. And he talks about that kind of belief producing righteousness. If you really believe it, you act on it. If we really believe that Jesus Christ came as the Son of God, that he paid the penalty for our sins, that he was crucified in our place, raised from the dead, ascended on high, and is going to return as King of kings and Lord of lords. And John certainly lays that out in the book of Revelation. If you really believe that, it'll change, transform your life every day. Well, brethren, it's wonderful to be back here with you again. Look forward much to this thing afterwards.